was like stood on top of a cliff and everything was falling apart. Royal Marine Commando Jason Fox. He spent 20 years in the Special Forces, but it's his journey after the military that is truly, truly fascinating. You might not care, but there are people that do care. I put him for Special Forces selection. Now we started with 350 and we finished with eight of us. What do you think those last eight people had that the others didn't? Yeah, you got me thinking now. We were outnumbered. One of our guys had already been killed within the first 20 seconds. I'm fucking scared. She was like, look, I would suggest that you are suffering from PTSD, but I'm like, what does that mean? I was in a spiral going down. People keep saying, oh, I understand why you got PTSD because you were in the military. And I was like, I don't think it can be attributed to that. It's a whole life inflection point. I got married. We had a kid. The kid was ill. We start splitting up. It was a, an, an extremely vicious circle and I was at the centre of it. If you've got toxic relationships in your life, it is going to impact your mental health, which in turn is going to then impact everything else that you are connected to. The first thing you've got to do and the only thing that really works is... What would you say the biggest learnings that you have from the military have been? The one thing I learned post-military service was... What is up and welcome back to Working Hard, Hardly Working. You are not ready for the podcast we have today. You are not ready because I have never heard this man speak in this way and be so open and so... I, 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 this, I was so excited recording this episode and I cannot wait for you to hear all of these stories and the behind the scenes. So without further ado, today I am so excited to have Jason Fox on the podcast. He spent 20 years in the Special Forces carrying out life-threatening missions in the most hazardous conditions. But it's his journey after the military that is truly, truly fascinating and one that he has been incredibly open about today. He left the military after being diagnosed with PTSD and today he speaks so, so openly about his mental health struggles, how much his life has changed and how he manages his mental health overall, but also when filming for huge shows like SAS Who Dares Wins. It's a long one and we get deep, but I promise you it's worth listening to. I'd go as far as to say it was quite a life-changing conversation. Getting guests like Jason is so, so huge and I am so grateful for everyone who listens to and shares and likes the podcast in order for us to be able to do this and have such incredible conversations. I would appreciate so, so much if you could like, rate, subscribe, review, whatever it is on the platform you're on, wherever you are, it helps us hugely and it helps us to have these open behind the scenes conversations with people who we usually don't get to see this type of insight into. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me in on this very large couch. I know, no one can actually see how large the couch is on um, because we split the screen, but I do think it is important information that we have to sit about two metres away from each other. Well, we've kept the, you, you've, you, sorry, you've kept the uh, social distancing thing. Yeah, but imagine if we took out this middle It'd thing. Be close, yeah. <laughs> It'd be far too It'd be, close. Yeah, be, We'd yeah. actually have complaints, I think. Yeah, definitely. So, without the complaints, I'd like to go straight into your decision to join the Marines at 16. What made you take that step? There was one I didn't do very well at school. I didn't apply myself. I absolutely catastrophically destroyed my GCSEs by not working hard and being lazy and not really loving being in class. I just loved being outdoors, mucking around. I didn't take life too seriously. That was one reason... The other one was I I grew up in um, Luton. My fiance is from Luton. Okay, I'll be careful what I say. Oh, don't worry, he's uh, not um, careful. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it was. You can it was, say exactly I, yeah, what it, was, it was. Um, it's not an affluent area, or it wasn't where I was anyway. And um, I was getting into trouble. I was easily led. I was a young lad, and somehow at sixteen, I I had the consciousness to realised that I needed to get away from there because I was going to get into trouble. I was <laughs> getting into trouble. And so I decided I was going to join the military. Now, my dad had been in the Marines like years before. Right. I don't remember. He left, you know, when I was about one. And so there, there was a direction as to if I was going to join the military, which way I was going to go. And yeah, I, I sort of took the leap. Went to the careers office in Luton and signed up. You moved straight into base. Is that how it works? Yeah. So how it works. Okay. I'll go into a little bit of detail. Mm. So what happens is you go into the careers office. There's some huge, nasty looking Marine. Perfect. And I'm like 
this young skinny little dweeb and I'm I said I'd like to join the Marines and he's like okay he goes get up onto that pull up bar and start doing pull ups and I've probably like eked out two and a half mm -hmm. and he was like right come back when you can do ten so I disappeared disappointed well I guess I'm never going to be a Marine trained a little bit came back did it again he's like right okay fine filled out a few forms did a I can't remember what it's called. It's like a competency test, which it isn't. It's basically like they'll show you a picture of like four cogs and they're like, if this one turns this way, which way does that one turn? And you've got to tell them and they're like, okay, you're, you know, you have a brain cell. IQ. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, then you go on a few other like medicals and then you go on a, for me, it was a four or five day course where you go down to the base, you live there and they absolutely thrash you as in like beast you exercise you make you feel very uncomfortable and if you pass that at the end of the week then you're giving a start date so you go home you keep yourself as fit as you possibly can and then you on that start date you get on the train with a, your bags packed with the right kit go down to this place called Limston you walk through the gates and then that is you starting 32 weeks of training well it was 30 weeks of training where I am they've adjusted it as we've gone through the years but yeah you start your Royal Marine and Commando training and what was that like living on base then when you did start on the journey down there I've obviously left home I'm 16 I'm mm. like wow this is exciting I'm yeah, just the big start bad world. My, yeah I'm joining the Marines I'm hard uh you turn up and it is a massive culture shock so I I was in an intake so they call them troops in the Royal Marines so I was in a recruit troop of about 60 guys I was one of two 16 year olds and everyone else was probably averaging about 22 years old, right. which doesn't seem, you know, a big gap, but it is when you're 16, it is a big gap. Like everyone else had had jobs, they'd left home. Me and this other guy, we didn't need to shave. I'd never, you know, I had a mum, she did everything. And all of a sudden you're getting given, issued like loads of kit. You're expected to be able to look after that kit, look after yourself, wash, clean, iron make yourself look presentable and it was that was the hardest bit for the first 10 weeks was keeping myself in order and getting sleep because I was like I can remember being up at like three in the morning still ironing clothes because I couldn't get it right and right then all the other guys are like some lads would help you but ultimately they've got to go to sleep then you go to sleep for like a couple of hours and you get up and it's like when it came to the physical stuff I wasn't too bad I was 16 years old you could like bounce me off the walls and the floor and I'd be all right. Um, the only thing that went in my favor at, at that time was because I was 16, used to being told off, shouted at, normally getting into trouble all the time. That sort of thing didn't bother me. It was the not being able to look after myself properly or up to a standard that they expected that sort of get, got to me a little bit. But you live, you, the first two weeks you're living in a dormitory that's like, Full, it's got like a hundred beds in it and you're all like lined up next to each other that lasts for two weeks then once you pass out from that initial phase you go into your proper accommodation blocks which are, you're in like a six-man room which is yeah it was different it's different to being at home with my two brothers what did you learn from that first year i guess the first year i learned that i could withstand a lot <laughs> I don't think I learned an awful lot about being a soldier because it seemed like a, an absolute blur. There was a period in that in that training um, phase of my life where I was struggling. I just didn't get it, and I was I can remember being on the phone to my mum crying. And I, I was never going to give up, but I can remember it being like really really difficult. And then somewhere somehow it just clicked, and it was around the 15 to 20 week period and all of a sudden I just got it and I did stuff and I enjoyed it I became good at something and yeah I, and I don't know where that came from I think that was just the I think it was just growing up I think it was just being a young boy that then suddenly clicked and realized I had to be a young man mm. and I sort of took things seriously applied myself where I needed to and then realized that I could be good at something and I enjoyed it. So let's talk about training. What was the Marines training like? They start off by, like you do, you're obviously doing PT all the time. Mm. Um, 
it, they start off gradually. You'll do like PT in a gymnasium, doing what they call in, initial military fitness, which is actually what they used to be called Swedish PT. And all you're doing is moving, making shapes with your body. It's like... Sure. Just it's weird. It's, yeah. it's like dance. It is. And it's yeah. got to be coordinated. And they have strikers like watching you, PTIs, physical training instructors. <laughs> instructors. If you don't get a movement right, they'll come along and yeah. give you a quick slap or make you do press ups. Or And you're in like pristine white like PT kit that you have to keep immaculately clean. It has to be ironed before you turn up. The creases down the front of your shorts. You look like a right bell end. Um, but it's all to do with discipline. It's all to do with movement. And then they move on to like actual military PT, which is like wearing combat bottoms and boots and running with kit and climbing ropes and hauling yourself over assault courses. And that's the stuff that you, you know, that you're waiting for. Right. That's, that's what you want to do. Yeah. So it is gradual that it's, it gradually gets there. And then at the same time as that's going on, they're teaching you how to look after yourself, how to keep your kit clean, how to shoot guns, how to like crawl around in the dirt without getting seen by the enemy all this you know all this stuff that as a young lad you think is cool was there anything that you were particularly bad at that you expected to be good at um there was stuff that i was particularly bad at that i didn't think about so like washing clothes and ironing you don't think no you don't think that's the main part of the marines no but you're doing you're doing a lot of your clothes washing by hand you're washing stuff by hand it's the only they've got a laundrette on on the base but the cues to use the washing machines and the tumble dryers are like ridiculous. So you're better off cleaning it by hand. You wash all your clothes by hand. You hang them in the drying room. You then get them out of the drying room when they're dry. You iron them, you fold them up, put them in your rocker. They've all got to be a certain. Everything's it's, got to be folded to the same size. It's it's ridiculous. But are you now in is. charge of washing in the household? Uh, washing, no ironing. Yes. Mm. Like I'm. I can only, imagine you're pretty skilled at that now. I've got a very good iron. I, I invest in irons. I have a phobia about leaving the house in unironed clothes. My missus thinks I'm mad because she doesn't really iron anything. But then clothes nowadays don't need it. They're made of like material that right. I even if it if she's like, oh, that doesn't need ironing. I'm like, it does. I think it's more to do with my um my peace of mind. I think it's very important. <laughs> please I'm glad to, you please to have had this impact from you I'm today. Glad, I'm glad you agree. Aside from the ironing, mm. mentally, how do you get through that level of training what's going on in your head how are you pushing through you've got to want to do it for the right reasons so something else that is a big shock to the system is when you go and live in the field so you'll do stints of like a week 10 days living in the bush and it is it's fucking cold wet and miserable that is what gets to people if you don't get comfortable with being horrendously uncomfortable then that isn't the job for you and that that was what the that was the biggest shot that was something that you don't expect because when you watch things on telly where soldiers are rolling around in the dirt you you forget that your your pants are piss wet through and covered in mud or full of mud and sands rubbing against all the bits of your body and it's all that uncomfortableness that you you, you just don't think about so when it happens you're like hang on a minute what's all this about and if you are doing or trying to do that job for the wrong reasons, then you will give up pretty pretty quickly. And so it was more, you know, my whole journey with becoming a Royal Marine at the beginning was, am I happy being uncomfortable? And, you know, the further I got into it, I was like, yeah, I like being uncomfortable. I like this. I like the challenge. I like the fact that I'm achieving something that is difficult, that is horrible, basically. And so tell me about the move from the Marines to the SBS. So I did about nine years in the Marines, loved it, loved, the, the, I loved being a soldier, but the Marines, you know, they're an elite military organisation, but they are still classed as conventional, which means they are also expected to carry out like ceremonial duties and things like that, right. basically like polishing your boots and mm-hmm. wearing smart uniforms like you see around London marching around and i fucking hate that Mm -hmm. i despise it i love being a soldier as in rolling around in the dirt and doing that sort of stuff but i didn't like the other stuff now i knew about the special forces i knew that they never got up to that stuff and they went and did other stuff that sounded cool and i also knew that they got paid more money so after nine years i was like right i'm getting a little bit 
I feel like I'm getting along in the tooth for this sort of marching around in shiny boots. So I thought if I'm going to stay in the military, which I want to do, I'm going to have to up up the game. And so I put in for special forces selection. Now all you have to do to do that is fill in a form saying I want to do special forces selection, put it in, and that's it. And then you go on to a waiting list. Then you'll get a, you'll get a, um, you'll get mail basically, and uh, it, it will be something saying right, you are going to start selection such and such. Make sure you're ready. Here's your joining instructions. This is the kit you need to bring with you. And then on that day. You travel down, well, we travel to Wales and you start selection. So that was, a, I was 20, 25. So I started selection when I was 25. Yeah, in 2002, I think that works out. At. So it's just after 2001, after 9-11. Um, and you start the process and it's it's long. And I know you can't talk specifically about details to do with SAS and kind of SBS training. Could you give me a little bit of an overview in terms of the difference between your life as a Marine versus in the SBS? The selection process is pretty grown up. You'll turn up, you do, it's broken down into phases. There's a phase in Wales, then you go abroad, basically operate in the jungle and prove that you can soldier in a very demanding environment. But no one really, it's not like, so I've done a TV show that we'll probably come on to later, but there's not a lot of shouting going on on Special Forces Selection. You're just expected to do stuff. And if you don't do it, then you, you leave. Right. They, they just tell you, okay, you've not met the grade, off you go. They don't give you any feedback. They don't say, well done, or what you're doing. You know, it's just like, you haven't made the grade, off you go. And it's like, it's quite cold like that. So that's the selection process. Then you pass, then you join you join a squadron within the special forces and it is different to being in the Marines because it is just busy. You are just busy. You even at the lowest rank you've given a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of pressure on you and you are doing stuff all the time. You can be abroad, you can be at home, you can be working with the police, you can be working with other country agencies somewhere else there's always something going on i mean it was well, like when i was in the special forces a lot of people knew what sort of was going on because it was heavily in the news you know you had iraq and afghanistan then syria all that sort of stuff was going on and it was quite obvious what we would have been doing whereas before that there was always still stuff going on but it just wasn't in the news right so it is it is busy it is you don't you don't get a chance to do an awful lot outside of your career and it has a massive impact on your home life I mean uh, as an example like in a 12 month period I probably slept in my own bed 30 days out of a whole 12 month period and that wasn't in one block so it's yeah you go away a lot and what did you learn about thriving under pressure in the special forces I learned that I love pressure I, I learned that I probably learned it a bit before, but it took it to another level being in special forces. You, I learned that without pressure, you don't really develop. You become stagnant and you don't truly find out about what you are capable of. And that, and actually, if people embraced pressure a little bit more, you would surprise yourself and be a lot more confident in what you could be doing, I, I think. And how do you think that in, I guess, everyday life, someone who's not in the military, how can you put yourself in situations that demand pressure and therefore, as you say, improve you and kind of show you what you can do? I've, I've, so it depends on, I mean, a lot of it depends on what your career is or what you've chosen to do, but you've got to keep pushing the realms of the world that you're in. I now do a live tour. Now, when someone asked me to do a live tour where I'm stood up in front of lots of people on a stage, I was like, ah, there's no fucking way I'm doing that. I can't think of anything worse. It doesn't really excite me. In fact, it petrifies me. And I kept turning it down for a period of time. And then I was like, hang on a minute. I'm, I've am i spent my life putting myself in uncomfortable situations. I tell people to put themselves in uncomfortable situations. I'm being a hypocrite. Right. And so I, I then... I, em I didn't embrace it. I was like, right, I'm going to do this because I'm going to do it because I'm feeling uncomfortable about it. 
So it's things like that. If there's something out there that you feel makes you uncomfortable, it's probably like an indication that you should try and have a go or embrace it. Whether it's like going, for, you know, people can be in a job and then they're, you know, there's an opportunity for promotion and they could be thinking to themselves, I don't want to do that because I don't want to, I feel like I'm not good enough or I, I'm, I'm not very good with certain situations, but they would never find out how to get through that without actually getting into it and mm -hmm. embracing it and having a go at it. And so it's things like that that I've been taught through my, you know, through my stint in the special forces, I reckon. Yeah, no, I can imagine. And within that kind of selection process that you were talking about, how many people were left at the end versus the beginning? So we started, it was a big course. So we started with 350 guys from all over the, you know, it's tri-service, which means it comes from every branch of the right, military. Okay. Um, and we finished with eight of us. So it's... Wow. And that's that's pretty much what it's like each time. I did not imagine that. Yeah. I don't know why. They don't, um, you lose an awful lot in the first four weeks and then you lose another and then the next. So you, we went from, in four, four weeks, we went from 350 to 60. We went away on the second phase with 60 and then you come back with like about 14. And then that slowly over the next few months gets whittled down. And um, yeah, it's a it's a high attrition rate. Now they would, they would, if they could, they would pass it. They want to pass people. They're not there of to course. fail them. They want, they, there's never enough, um, I mean, it's the wrong word, but there's never enough like human resources in the special forces. The, the job dictates that it needs people, but it, the, there's, there's never enough people. And the, But they won't let the standards slip and rightly so. Of course. And what do you think those last eight people had that the others didn't? Uh, <laughs> I reckon we're all just stubborn. Um, Perfect, I'll do it. I re yeah, see, there you go. Qualified. If you're stubborn, if you're stubborn, if you guys need me, it. just let me know. Uh, a bit, obviously, physically robust. You don't have to, everyone thinks you've got to be like super fit. You've got to be fit, but you just got to be able to take the knocks and like deal with feeling like you're hurting. Mentally, I'd say you've got to be robust and you've got to want to do that job. You've got to love being in uncomfortable situations, but stubbornness is the, that is the, that is the key. And when you've been in those terrifying situations as part of the military, not just kind of the training, but I can imagine there are some really life-changing, terrifying situations. What's your kind of coping mechanism for getting through that? Mm. There's been, de it depends on where you are in your career. So like early on, my coping mechanism was to think that I was young and indestructible and I didn't give a shit. Right. And I knew that I was confident in what I was doing. But then as you promote through the through the ranks, you get into positions where you're like in charge of people or you're responsible for actions. I can remember being in a situation where it was a very, very hairy situation. We were we were basically getting we were outnumbered. We were in a we were basically conducting a mission in an extremely hostile environment. One of our guys had already been killed within the first 20 seconds pretty much and I can remember being in a ditch being shot at and I remember thinking to myself I'm fucking scared now this was like way into my career and I and as far as I was concerned I shouldn't have been feeling scared because you know I've done this stuff before but all of a sudden I'm I'm in a ditch at about I was 34 years old thinking about wanting to be at home with my mum and it like that's what freaked me out. And I was like, hang on a minute, what am I doing? I'm I'm not supposed to be feeling like this. And at that point, my coping mechanism was to sort of give myself that proverbial slap round the face and remind myself that I was in that position because I deserved to be there, that I'd done stuff before that had gone in, you know, gone in favour of my capability. So I got promoted, I did courses. But then at the same time as I was like telling myself to get a grip. I was like in this, I was in a ditch, it was at night and I was looking down the ditch and there was other guys like parts of the team that I was in with me and I just took a lot of strength from the fact that I wasn't on my own, that I was with those people, that I, there were guys that I loved that were good at their job and that I had a responsibility to them. 
So it was a couple of things. So in the early days, if that had happened to me, I'd have been like, yeah, I'll fucking know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm hard as, you know, I'm good at being a soldier. Whereas as you progress on, you become a different person. And, you know, I had to dig a little bit deeper and in those in those scary situations. So I think it changes. Yeah, and I can imagine as well that obviously the toughness is very important. And obviously, as you're saying, it's not just sheer be as tough as you can and almost be reckless. It's actually you need to have a good grasp on your surroundings and your situation and the risk as well. Yeah, it isn't like if it sounded like I was saying we were reckless, we weren't. It no. was just it was just more of like when you're younger, you just feel a little bit more indestructible. That doesn't mean that we were reckless. We were far from we were like very we we're actually risk averse. We go into things and we risk assess all the time. You know, mm. you do constantly you'll be in on the ground involved in something you'll be in the middle of a gunfight and you'll be doing dynamic risk assessments right if i move from where i am now to where i want to be is that a good move is that route safe or is there a better way of doing it you're always looking at that but you're just probably a little bit more as a younger person i feel like you do feel that you can bounce back from things quicker and and that you don't need to worry too much about your you know your psychological or, or how, what the psychological effect will be on you whereas when you're a little bit older and you've gone through other things and you've seen the impact on not only yourselves but other people you are a bit more aware of that and so your mechanisms for coping change as you as you do that but yeah you are still very much a uh you're just a confident risk taker and, and someone that is also checking and making sure that the risk isn't you know beyond the realms of acceptability. And so let's talk about moving on from the military. When did you start to have those kind of inklings? Because I can imagine it wasn't all at once. So I I left the military at my 20, I did 20 years pretty much, and I didn't want to leave. What happened was I came back for those, so that, that job I was just talking about where I was in a ditch, that was my last tour operational tours in Afghanistan I came back from that and we, we you you come back from being away in a place like that and you go and you go into other commitments and roles within the special forces and you can be doing stuff in the UK all over the place so you're doing all that sort of stuff and then I was getting ready to go away again on another tour and it was going back out to Afghanistan and I can remember feeling like that period that was looming in the in the near distance was like a black cloud mm. and I was like you know why do I feel like this I'm you know I'm supposed to be excited about this I've loved this job and uh it and it and it got worse and I was like dreading going away and I was like what what's going on this isn't right and I was trying I was having to dig deep to motivate myself to do all the training scenarios that you have to go through before you go away I was responsible for leading men as well, like I had been before. And I was finding it difficult to motivate myself, to motivate them. And I thought, right, this isn't fair on them or me. And so I sort of went and saw the, uh, they have a, like a psychiatric department that no one ever goes to see. Of course. So I went in on the sly, you know, snuck in there. Undercover. Undercover. And in I went, camouflage. Mo mo yeah, in camouflage, in a camouflage base, uh, where everyone wears camouflage. But um <laughs> I, I went in and saw and presented myself to the uh, mental health nurse. And I said, look, I don't want you to, I want this to be off the record, by the way. Right. I says, I'm not, f I'm not feeling my usual self about my job. Can you, um, I was expecting, fix. I was basically like, can you just snap your fingers yeah, and yeah. fix me and I'll be good to go. And she's like, mm, okay, sit down. Anyway, we had this, 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 this went on for a period of time. And in the end, she was like, look, I'm going to have to start making this formal because I, I would suggest that you are suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, well, we can just, you know, we can sort of like, we can take you away from work for a bit and we can work on you. And and I was like, what the fuck, what's this all about? And I thought, right, <laughs> You're okay. making this very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, yes, this, this doesn't need to happen. I just, you need to tell me something and it yeah, works yeah. and I, I, I get fixed. And she's like, it's not going to work like that. And I was like, okay, so I sort of succumbed to the system and then, before I know it, and then I'm very, I'm condensing this now. Before I know it, they're like, oh, look, you need to leave the military. And I was like, I don't want to leave the military. I love this job. And they're like, you've got, you're going to have to leave. It's the only thing that's going to fix you. And I wrestled with this for like a month. 
and in the end, and I could see the impact it was having on me, you know, and and at home. And um, I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I'll go through this whole medical discharge um, thing, which I didn't want to do, but I felt like I had to do it. And then, you know, it happened pretty quickly. Within about three months, I got medically discharged from the military. And I can remember it was on the 5th of, my, my last day serving was on the 5th of April, 2012. And I was expecting to wake up on the 6th of April feeling better. And I didn't, I felt worse. Can imagine. And what was it like moving on? Because obviously the military is very much the definition of kind of mm. your job is your life. I can imagine that's not just it's not it's not moving on from a job. It's a whole life inflection point. What was that like for you? It was it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, I'd say. It was um Yeah, it was horrendous, to be honest. I I mean Obviously, like my, the job that I did was probably a catalyst, but it wasn't the job that affected me more, more than anything. It was, it was normal everyday life that properly affected me. And the reason for that is, because, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens to everyone. You know, people keep saying, oh, I understand why you got PTSD because you're in the military and the special forces, you're away fighting. And I was like, mm, yeah, I don't think it can be attributed to that. It's more attributed to the fact that, you know, I met someone, I got married, we had a kid, the kid was ill, we argue, car breaks down, the washing machine breaks, we ain't got enough money for the bills, kid's back in hospital, we start splitting up, get divorced, you know, all that stuff. I've I've never once in my life, as, as anyone else, been taught how to deal with that. And it was that that was impacting me more, but it was obviously mixed up with the other stuff. And I think that's so important to say as well because I can imagine and it would probably be easier for you to sit here and say yeah of course I was in the military I was being shot at of course I would you know go down that to to openly say actually some of the normal quote-unquote stuff yeah was the stuff that really had that impact in amongst obviously other things but I, I think that's actually really 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 powerful yeah I think um I mean I I, sp I thought about it a lot because I mean, I left and, um, you know, I I contemplated suicide, whether it was going to happen or I don't know. I was like stood on top of a cliff and everything was falling apart. And I didn't. I walked away and it was at that point I was like, right, I need to I need to do something. If, if I'm not going to do that, I need to make sure that I'm doing something that's going to change my life. And one of the first things I did was I looked back at my life up to the point I was and I started drawing lines that represented stuff that happened in my life. And where the most lines converged, as in like, so if you, this is a really bad example for a podcast, but if you draw like one long line, which is you being born to where you are, and then underneath that, you draw other lines. So that's your timeline. Then you do one that, you know, you've got a line that's your career, your military career. And then within that, you've got career courses where you're expected to perform. You've got marriage, birth of kids, divorce, all those things, cars breaking down, everything I've no mentioned before, but where the lines all converge the most in a period of time, that's probably where something was going to snap. And if I'd have been paying attention to that at the time, I'd have been able to address it better. Mm. But you, no one ever does. It's only with hindsight. And I was like, that's that's when it, and, and I can see it now and I, and I could see it then. And I was like, that's where I should have been paying more attention to myself. And like checking in with myself and being aware that I need to be easy on who I am mm. because things aren't going right and things are looking like they're falling apart. I need to try and learn about normal life and how to deal with it. And I didn't, but but doing that exercise after I'd been through a really sort of sticky period was cathartic and it helped me. And I was mm. like, right, this is what I need to start doing is to start being aware of what's going on around me. Yeah, and I think that's so interesting as well because I think we think a lot about, you know, when someone says, I'm really anxious, someone says, about what? Or, you know, you're saying, I'm feeling I'm feeling down. And it's kind of, it's always expected to be linked to one individual trigger. Mm. And I think the, or that's like our general top line understanding of mental health and actually realizing how much other things have an impact. And I always say kind of, you can have it all, but you cannot have it all at once. Mm. You cannot expect to be 
flying in your career whilst also having an amazing personal life like it's it's an unrealistic expectation you can absolutely expect to you know have hygiene levels of what you want but it, if you're going to be having a period of time where you're really leaning into your career or you're really leaning into your family life something has to yeah. go like it's a percentages thing it's about it's a kind of like scale going up and down rather than this idea of balance that's like a 50 50 to me that's completely unrealistic mm -hmm. and i think that kind of overwhelm of like i think on top of it as well there's like the amount there's the amount of feedback we get the amount of information we get on other people's lives and with things like social media there's a lot of there's just so much noise now mm -hmm. that actually when you're also trying to balance your own things when it comes to career personal life all of these things if you also add on the fact that you then like open your phone and you see like someone from school's got married and someone you know has just had a promotion and all of these things it really does add on Personally. like it's unseen weight that's kind of put into your box of things that you're currently dealing with yeah that is an issue that we have in nowadays with the tech that we've got available to us you know there's a lot of outside influence that doesn't need to be influenced, but we make it or we allow it to be because of whether it's Instagram, anything else you can access on your phone. But the one thing I will say in, in like the fact that it is very difficult to, to have a balance because it, you know, you've always, something's always got to be getting more for it to benefit as, you know, for your family to benefit, they've got to be getting more time. But then that means your career is going to have an impact. You know, it's going to be impacted. But then you you switch and you you got to put more time in your career because that's what you need to do. In fact, the one thing you can do to to at least soften the blow is communicate. Like the one thing that we humans love to do, whether we like it or not, is communicate. That's why you've got a podcast, so on and so forth. But we're also shit at it mm. when it comes to people that are closest to us. The one thing I learned was I was an absolutely terrible communicator when I was in the military, even though that we were brilliant communicators. That was our job, was to communicate and make sure everyone understood everything we were doing. Brilliant at that work, go home. I wouldn't tell my missus what I was doing from one day to the next. I wouldn't explain to her that I can't, you know, I, even if I'd just sat down and gone, I can't tell you where I'm going, but I'm gonna be okay and I'm gonna be thinking about you. And rest assured, I've got this, this and this in place if you need it. If I'd have done that, things would have been a lot better, but I didn't. And it's the one thing I've learned going forward, you know, even now, there'll be times when I go away, but I'll make sure that I'm communicating all the time and, and before I go, when I'm gone, and when I come back about what it is I'm doing, what I'm gonna be doing, what I have been doing, whatever it is, I make sure that people feel involved because if you're communicating, you're just being a better person. And with mental health in mind and kind of a lot of the crisis that we talk about at the moment in terms of, you know, mental health, men's mental health in particular, do you think overall we're kind of too hard or too soft? Oh, I've wrestled with this over the last God knows how long, few years, because I'm someone that talks openly about my mental health and I'm like, you know, you've got to talk about it. You've got to admit that you've got something going on and share it and people have got to be accepting of that. On the flip side, it isn't, it, just talking about it isn't enough and it isn't all, it isn't a get out of jail free card as well. You can't just say, oh, you know, I'm struggling please leave me alone. I don't want to do anything. I just want to run away from everything because that's unrealistic. You've got to realise that it is also, you know, to get through periods of poor mental health, you've got to put a shift in. Mm. It's not easy. You've got to realise that hard work is required by yourself to get yourself out of it. You've got to, if you admit that to yourself, then it, it's going to make it actually easier, weirdly. But, yeah, I don't know whether we've, we're too soft or too hard. I think it depends on the individual. Do you know what I mean? There's like 8 billion people on the planet and each one of them is different. The, the way that we interact with each other when it comes to mental health has to be tailored to the individual. So some too hard on one person could be too easy on another. So we've got to be a little bit wary or aware of, of where people are at. But ultimately... We need to be compassionate, but at the same time, people have got to realise that it's tough and you've got to put a shift in, dig in. Let's talk about then the process of actually moving on from the military. What was it like 
looking for a job uh, afterwards. Weird. Uh, I'd never done a job interview as such. Pull ups. Never. You walk in, a, you go straight, a, straight to yeah, the door, no, and yeah. you go, "Look at this." So I, I, I went for yeah, exactly. I went for a, <laughs> I went for a corporate job actually in a facilities management company, and there was an interview, and I was like, "Where's the pull up bar?" And they're like, "What the fuck are you going on about, you weirdo?" <laughs> I might not be able to do this, but um, watch this. Yeah, exactly. I had to write my own CV. I'd never been taught to write that, and it was pretty much like Johnny, age five, red crayon. Like, my name is Jason. I went to war. And they're like, oh, "Okay, what <laughs> what can you offer us?" I was like, oh, "I don't know. I can can shoot a gun." <laughs> But uh, no, they the, uh, the kind. I think it was out of the kindness of their heart, and it was the, it was the kindness of the guy who I'd met's heart. He was the MD of this company. I'm still good friends with him. He said, "I'll give you a job." So I got a job. Um, I was a projects manager and a logistics manager for a facilities management company. So they're responsible for cooking and cleaning and you know l driving people around and okay. all that sort of thing. And it was you know. It was all right. I had a car, got given a company car. I felt like a grown up, mm. but it, I just struggled with it. I was, it was a it was a regular nine to five job. Um, it was a culture shock. I had not really worked with people outside the military. I'd be sat at a desk every now and again, typing away on a computer. I'd misspell something. I'd lose my shit. Everyone in the office would like look up and think that I was some absolute fucking lunatic and I'd be like and they're like you're really aggressive and I'm like but I'm not I'm just I'm just angry with myself I'm not angry with anyone else I'm just <laughs> I'm like causing like drama and yeah it was um it was a difficult time I did I did the job for about I agree I, I pushed it out I did about 18 months and I wasn't I, I was good at the I was good at what I needed to do which was organize stuff and you know you know, get people to do things in a in a way that they were happy with, but I would, I just wasn't fulfilled, and I was fucking up other things within it. Uh, my home life. So by this stage, I'd been divorced once already. I'd got remarried, and that was falling apart as well because of because of a lot of things. Because of both of us, I'm not going to take the full blame, but there was also. You know, a lot of a lot of it was on me. I'd just come out of the military for mental health reasons and I was like in an absolute I was in a spiral going down and um I could see it was impacting the job and the people around me in that job and I turned around to the MD and I said, Look, mate, I know I'm causing you a massive drama here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna resign. And uh, he knew the predicament I was in I was in, I was like hard up I wasn't doing very well financially. Mm. Uh, I had a lot of commitments and not enough money to for those commitments and he said look mate don't don't resign i'll make you redundant and he didn't need to do that and i wasn't led i wasn't actually i didn't i didn't um qualify to be made redundant i'd been there long enough but he he squared it away so i'd left with a little bit of money to help me and i was then sort of like rudderless pretty much looking for what the next thing was i i was living around friends houses on sofas and they weren't this big. It would have been not. I wouldn't have been. I'd have been happy with this sofa to sleep on, to be quite frank. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was. I was cutting around, wondering what the next thing was. Did a bit of bodyguarding, which is what you know my old job would have lend it would sort of lend itself to. But yeah, it's if not... you said no to me at the front of a club, I would say okay, sir. Sorry, well, I wasn't. Sorry. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't working the door. I was like looking after people when they went to different places. But um, but yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It wasn't what I wanted to do either. So I was just a bit rudderless, mm. and it was. It was difficult. And you talk about at these key points in your life, kind of the importance of your relationship and your family life as kind of an impact on your wider, you know, your mental health, how work was going, all of that. Yeah. I think that's first of all. I think that's very powerful because I think it's especially within a kind of military type background it's almost seen as a, not necessarily like a lesser part of life, but definitely as a, you know, the concentration is like the big things and the important things. And that's kind of less talked about. You openly talk about that as something that affected your mental health at times and actually was a huge part of your life when things were falling apart. I'd yeah. like to know about, I guess, the importance of those relationships as a whole in your kind of career, your life, your mental health? If you've got relationships in your life with 
people that are close to you, if they are not good because of one thing or another, now that doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's home life with a partner, um, relationship you've got with people at work, if one of them, you know, at the bare minimum, if one of them is toxic and unhelpful and there's bad communication, it is going to impact your mental health, which in turn is going to then impact everything else that you are connected to because it's very difficult to silo one thing from another. There are people out there, no doubt, that can do that. But mo I don't think the majority of us can. You know, when if we're pissed off or upset about something, someone else will know about it. Fact. And if we, d if we don't communicate with that person as to why, they'll get pissed off with you. And then you'll get pissed off with it. And then it just, mm. it just absolutely snowballs. So, yeah, I think it was a, an, an extremely vicious circle and I was at the center of it. So I was responsible for that by not acknowledging it, not understanding it, not being aware, and then not communicating that out. So, yeah, 100%, you are correct. Thank you, I try to be. <laughs> and let's talk about your move into a career in TV, because that sounds like quite a jump from where you were yeah. at the time. How did that come about? Right, okay. So I was struggling. I'd left that job. I got a very, very good friend. In fact, he's my best mate. He was my best man. I was his best man. We were in the Marines together years ago. We, we had a great time pissing up, traveling the world, loving life when we were young and had no responsibility. He left a little bit before me and he did a few bits and pieces, but he was he was hell bent on wanting to work in television as a okay. safety supervisor, as someone that went away to far fung places and looked after people. And he, he'd, he'd started to do that and he was starting to do really well. Anyway, he knew that I was in this really sticky predicament you know, no money now separate, you know, separated from the person I was with at the time and I was, I was struggling. And uh, he got me to come, he said, mate, I've got a job on down in Southampton. I'm just stunt rigging for this BBC show. He was like, can you just come down and give us a hand? I was like, yeah, no worries, got down there. He's like, look, I ain't got much money for this. He goes, but I'll split the day rate with you if you just, so, I, you know, I was like, mate, no worries. I'm just, just happy to be doing anything. We, you know, we, it was that was almost like his interview for me. So I basically, you know, we'd worked in the Marines, but this was our first time working outside of it together. A couple of weeks later, he phones me up and he's like, mate, I've got a load of work on. I'm actually about to go out to Africa to do this job, but I've got another job on in Madagascar that I can't cover. Can you, can you cover for me? And I'm like, yeah, mate, I'll do the job. What is it? And it was basically going out to this small tropical island just off the coast of Madagascar with a film crew and being their team medic and the underwater cameraman's dive buddy. So that was it. I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Flew out. So I'm there as their medic. We're in like the jungle it, by the sea. And we and they were filming these underwater archaeologists, like diving on old pirate shipwrecks, looking for antiquities and whatnot. I was the underwater cameraman's dive buddy. So all I'd do is sit underwater <laughs> about, at about eight meters he's filming shit and every now and again i'm checking his air and like giving him a thumbs up yeah he's still got enough air or i'd be like all right we've got to go up because you run out of air that's it and then every, every time someone hurt themselves i'd look after them or whatever or tell someone not to fucking walk across the road when it was busy you know, sure yeah like helpful that. and um it, we were out there it was, it was awesome we we're living in a five-star resort on this tropical island amazing pissing up every night doing this cool stuff, watching these old guys dive on old, they'd like pick up teacups every now and again, you know, people, stuff that people pirates cheer. used to use, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, one day me and the, the cameraman, Sam, we're, we're on the surface with our buoyancy A's inflated, just sort of like bored, been out there like three weeks. And one of the old guys comes up from below and he's like swims over to us and he goes, lads, I'm telling you, I've found, the adventure galley which was like captain kids apparently captain kids lost ship we're like yeah whatever anyway he he swims over to the side to go and recharge his cylinders so we can carry on diving and we're like actually ah, we go and see what he's fucking going on about so we go down it's only like eight meters deep go down to the seabed where his dive site he's all marked it and it doesn't look like a ship it's just it's just a, like bits of decaying wood and rock and but he's he's like dug a hole into the into the um into the seabed. Sam's got the camera, he's filming it and he's like, ah, 
like gesturing for me to go into the into this hole sort of like swim in it's dark murky can't see anything and i'm just scratching around in it like like basically decimating this guy's pristine dive site <laughs> He's and, just and gone then, for lunch. And then, yeah, exactly. He's, <laughs> He's gone for lunch and we livid. fucked everything up. <laughs> anyway, in the process, I can feel something in the mud and it's like cold and hard and I'm like wrestling with it and can't <laughs> can't lift it out of the hole. Cool. I'm like out to Sam. He puts a camera down, swims over. We wrestle this thing out of the hole, put it on the seabed. He goes back to get the camera and I'm like, you can't see anything because it's dirty. There's like mud in the water. So I'm like trying to clear it, fan it away. And then it clears. He comes over the camera and there's a lump of metal. And it's about that big. It's about that thick. It's grey, but it's like you rub it and it shines. And it's got like a big T carved into it and an S. It's got like 95 and then some other symbols. And we're like looking at each other like, what's this? We then realise we've just fucked his dive site up. So we've basically like launched this thing back in the hole and <laughs> swam up, got, you know, surfaced. <laughs> got to the surface as he's going down we've swam over to the side it's in the in the afternoon by this stage got out de-rigged de-serviced everything washed our wetsuits down and whatever yeah. and then we've gone over to you know we're just waiting like, for him to find the, his like, treasure we're just laid in the sun like this fucking waiting for, we're like oh, we're gonna get a fucking bollocking in a minute 100 percent. he was a miserable <laughs> twat as well he comes up he pops his head up about 20 minutes later swims over to the side gets out goes through the whole rigmarole of de-servicing de his equipment and then he comes over to us and he's like got this face like fun day he's like you two come with me so we sort of like wander follow wander over to the he drags us away from all the other people just so we're out of earshot and uh we're like a couple of fucking naughty school kids and um he turns around and he's like you found it didn't you we're like ah, yeah what is it he goes i'm telling you now he goes that's fucking that's part of captain kids lost treasure and we're like well, whatever but yeah it turned out it was like a 55 kilogram bar of silver biggest one ever found they attributed to captain kid that it, it was something that he plundered in the atlantic from the bolivians i don't know but yeah it all it erupted and um like it all the bbc news came out france 24 which is another french news platform like the whole place went absolutely mental it's this small little island in the middle of nowhere no one had ever heard of it and then all of a sudden it was all on tv and it was this this thing you know pirate treasure found um that job finished and i'm like i was like ah, this is awesome this tv world's fucking brilliant and i'm on i'm on a plane flying back to the uk and i'm like what's next I wonder what's next i've been i've got paid it was all right another bar of treasure somewhere yeah but then what happened was there was a guy that was on that shoot and obviously, as you're probably aware, you know, the, the media world is freelance. People bounce all over the place. He'd gone and started another job with another company. And he was in a meeting where Channel 4 just basically commissioned this TV show about taking people on special forces selection. So it was an idea. And they were literally like, where the fuck are we going to find these ex-special forces guys and he was like i've just been out in madagascar this geezer foxy just... we should give him a call so i got the call and that's how that that's how it sort of came about they were like do you want to do this show and i was like no i didn't want to do it because i did it didn't sit right with me to go on telly but then i realized i needed to pay the bills and my mental health wasn't in a great space so i said yes and are you happy you did i am happy i did yeah <laughs> Turned out all right. Good news. Turned, turned out all right as it stands at the moment. Yeah, that's yeah, it was all right. Yeah, that's an unbelievable story. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there's a few. There's there was there has been um, people in the press that said that lump of metal that we found was lead, and it. I'm telling you now, they ain't seen it. I saw it. It was fucking silver. Um, <laughs> lead lead doesn't shine. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and also a little bit poisonous. A little bit poisonous, but yeah. you know. They, 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 you know. Did weird. you get a part in the winning? No, there's no no such thing as that. So basically, UNESCO got involved. It all got a little bit heated. We nearly got run out of the. Like, we we nearly got lynched because the ugh, it was a it was a big political hoo ha. The the, the Madagascar is an old French colony. Okay, so they still got influence from the French. UNESCO is run in France, so it's very right. French dominated. Um, the majority of the archaeological team were Americans, so then they were saying that the Americans were there 
looting and plundering and then the locals got angry at us we had to look at i had to basically put together or help come up with what a, an evacuation plan was going to look like for the crew it didn't get to that point there was no winnings but the president of madagascar who'd never even heard of this island rocked up he's obviously in charge <laughs> of it and I, I and as far as i'm aware it is a paperweight somewhere in the uh, really? presidential palace of madagascar how lovely for him yeah i'm, I'm sure glad that it, was yeah. redistributed it's probably a doorstop very useful one it's heavy as fuck mm, i can imagine yeah it's got big doors in the palace no doubt since then you've obviously had a very i mean a similar in some way career to what you were doing in the special forces based on the actual program that you've been doing yeah. but obviously very different in other ways what would you say the biggest i guess learnings that you have from the military that you've then taken into i guess a more normal job have been the biggest learning is is it's good not to be shot at. But, yes, um, no. fair enough. The the one thing I learned post military service, but realised we did very well, was I call it now to live life like a toddler. What I mean like by that is not to go around shitting your pants and expecting people to clean up after you. It's to live in the now. Now we do that very. Well, they do it very well in the military because when everything's going absolutely to a ball of chalk you live more in the now and just deal with what you can deal with to get out of it you don't worry about what's happened before and you don't worry about what hasn't happened in the future you're just there present although the present isn't very nice you were present now the reason i learned or relearned that in a different way was when i was going through what i call the very constructive therapy so i used to go and see someone it was a um a lady called Alex, she was unbelievable. She still is unbelievable. We, we, weirdly, we've become friends now, but she's a qualified psychotherapist, but she can be alternative, if that makes sense, as we used to go for walks in the woods and like talk about shit. And um, there was this one time when we were watching, she told me to watch this kid that was playing with her mum, like in the out in a park. And I'm like, fucking weird. She goes, no, just, just, just <laughs> keep an eye on the kid while we talk. So we're talking. Anyway, the, after like 40 minutes, she was like, what have you noticed about the kid? And I was like, well, it's just been a kid. It's just like fucking, it's played, it's enjoyed itself. Mm. I heard it crying not long ago, then it's playing again. And she was like, yeah, yeah. She goes, well, what's it doing? I said, well, it's just loving life. She's like, yeah. And then I suddenly realized that, you know, you know, through the course of this little session that kids, like toddlers, 18 month old, two year olds, they didn't give a shit about what's happened before. They don't care about what hasn't happened in the future. They just live in the now. They're like ho hoovers. They go around exploring, doing stuff, pushing their boundaries, hurting themselves in the process, crying, you know, dealing with that moment of pain. Then they get back up and they go at it again. And they still do things without worrying about what's just happened and without caring about the future. And that's one of the biggest learnings I've learned going forward now that I knew in the military, but not in that way, not in that context, but had to reteach myself. And it's the one thing that I always remind myself to do every morning because it's, we spend too long as adults and it's a learned thing. Dwelling on the past in a negative way, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I could have done this. Oh, that happened. Oh God, everything's against me. And then in, because of that, we worry about things happening in the future that, have ne that haven't happened, which is ludicrous. And we should just be more present. I so, love that. Live life like a toddler. Live life like a toddler. Don't Tick. pee your pants. Don't pee your pants. No. Important. Both important. Yeah. Good caveat. Very, very, very. And keep your diary dates and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, that's the grown up side in us. And so what's next? So there's uh, hopefully lots of things, but you never know. But at the moment, I've got, um, I've got a tour coming up in January, February 2024. It's the third round of this tour. So I've done it before. I did it a couple of years ago. I did it this year. No, I did it a year ago. I did it this year, January, February, and I'm doing it again because I, I've actually really enjoyed it. That It was the thing that I didn't want to do. Mm. It was scary. I did it. I loved it. I became comfortable with it and I'm doing it again and again. We're going to different venues. So that's, that's pretty much it. It's, it's got a lot of what I've spoken about in it. There's it, it its backbone is my journey with mental health, where it start, where I started, where it started, where it ended up, and where I've where I'm going. There's a lot of things that I've I speak. There's 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 a lot of deep meaningful stuff in there that I've 
yeah, I suppose I've learned or experienced along the way, but there's also a lot of funny shit because there is a lot of funny shit involved as well. Um, there's a lot of behind the scenes stories from the show because there's been a few shows now and there's a lot of funny things that go on in the background. Um, they, they, that will, so each time, so this, this tour now that I'm going to be, that we're going to be doing in January, February, it will have new stories in compared to the other ones because Mm. things have happened. Like there are funny things that have happened, especially in the show. We've got a show going out at the moment as we're recording this. That's got some interesting characters in it. You've got got the uh, people like Matt Hancock. You've got um, Gareth Gates, Zoe Lyons, who's a comedian. She's very, very weird, very funny. So there there might be some things um, linked to them. How was Matt Hancock? Um, From a special forces perspective. I've got to be very careful what I say here. I mean, he's he's a he's a very academically intelligent person. He's cl- he's clever. You know, he went to he went to Oxford and did PPE at seventeen. That's I would say. You know, if you're if you're into academia and people that are good at it, that's impressive. Mm-hmm. If you ask him to do something, he is very very motivated and will put in a hundred and ten of his percent. But he's still a politician, isn't he? I was going to say, he's the one who did PPE, but that was a very know, political answer from you, sir. How? how <laughs> no, no, but he, he, he uh, yeah, I know the irony. <laughs> You've did, been learning he, from he, Mr. He Matt. He did politics, philosophy and economics and then it, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. Great, what a good place to end. <laughs> he, puts, he puts a shift in. Let's, let's end on a high, shall we? <laughs> we I'll find a new question. Let's talk about someone else. If you could go back and talk to the 16-year-old you who was just about to join the Marines, what advice would you give yourself? I've thought about this a lot. I would tell, I'd tell myself that you're going to have a very good life. It's going to be a lot of fun. But there's going to be some tough times within it and when those tough times come about just go and find someone to talk to that's what i'd tell them i think that's really good i think that's very important